Let's suppose we know a function f, and we know it to have an inverse that we will write as f with a negative 1 for a suffix and pronounce as f inverse. I want to suppose that f inverse acts on a domain whose variable name is x and produces a new value that we will call y. So y equals f inverse of x. It would be equivalent to write this in an alternative form x equals f of y. If I want, I'm entitled to take either of these two equations and substitute it into the other. In doing that, I will see explicitly what it really means for one function to be an inverse of another. For example, let's take the equation for x and substitute it into that for y. Like so. We could just as well do it the other way round and substitute the y into the equation for x. In fact, both of these new equations are entirely equivalent to each other, and they both just tell us that if we apply a function followed by its inverse in either order, we end up back where we started, from y to y or from x to x. Notice that here the variable names x and y are not really important. They could be anything. It's the properties of the function here that we're interested in, the process of what happens. In this recording, I want to try and find out something about how to differentiate an inverse function. Since y equals f inverse x, what we're talking about here is finding out something about dy by dx. Since we're basing our whole argument on the premise that we know the function f of y, then what we're hoping, I suppose, is that the dy dx here might end up being expressed in terms of the f of y and possibly its derivatives. As it turns out, it's a fairly trivial process to make this discovery, as long as you've got the notation set up in the right way. So that's what I need to do next. In fact, I'm going to now dispense with the names f and f inverse and streamline things a bit. Think about y. It's a function of x, so it would be reasonable to write y equals y of x. But then, entirely equivalently, x is a function of y, so we could write x equals x of y. All I've done, really, is replace the names f and f inverse with the names x and y for the functions. But now I'm going to apply the substitution process that I did just now with the f's, only using this new notation. Let's substitute the x of y into the x in the y expression. This one here. This might look a bit strange to you if you're not very used to composite functions, but it's just a double composite. In fact, this equation here is entirely equivalent to the first red one above. It's just the function names that are different, x and y instead of f inverse and f. Well, now here comes the clever bit. And if you're not used to this, I agree that it might at first look a little bit suspicious, a bit dubious, but I assure you that it is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. I'm going to take this lowest equation at the bottom here and differentiate it with respect to the variable y. And of course the left-hand side is now very simple. dy by dy is just 1. But what about the right-hand side? Well, the right-hand side is a composite. We know how to deal with composites when we're differentiating. We use the chain rule. We differentiate the outer function with respect to the thing inside it. Here the outer function is y, and the thing inside it is x. So our first step should be to write dy by dx. But then the chain rule tells me I must progress inside the composite, where I see an x of y, and I must differentiate that x of y with respect to its independent variable, which is y. So I next write dx dy. And now we've discovered something rather profound. Let's divide both sides by, for example, dx by dy. We've discovered that dy by dx is the reciprocal of dx by dy. Now, maybe that's not so surprising to you. After all, the reciprocal of three-fifths is five-thirds. But actually, with these objects, these derivatives, it should be surprising. 
After all, a derivative is not just a simple pair of numbers dividing into each other. Calculating a derivative requires first principles and the application of a limit. It should not be at all obvious that this equation is true. Nevertheless, it is true, and it turns out to be very useful. Do you remember dy dx, the thing we've said we wanted to calculate? That's just the derivative of f inverse, because y was f inverse of x. The underlined equation here. OK, so on the left, at the bottom, we've got d by dx of f inverse. And that's 1 over something, and the something is dx dy. Let's go back to the top again and look at how x was related to y. That's the second equation near the top here that I'll underline now. x was f of y. So dx by dy is the derivative of f. We can write that as f primed of y if we wish. So what we've discovered by this stage is that differentiating an inverse function is really very easy. We just differentiate the original function and take its reciprocal. The problem lies in the fact that that reciprocal depends on y. The hard part in all of these problems is actually getting back to x at the end. That's the subject of several other maths casts, so I'm not going to talk about that here. We have at least now derived the rule that we could call the differentiating rule for inverse functions. I want to draw a line under that now and just go back and finish off by thinking a little bit more about the meaning of the reciprocal of derivative that we see here in the middle of the page. Many people, when they first see this, think that such a rule might naturally extend to second and higher derivatives. d2y by dx squared. Might it be 1 over d2x by dy squared? Well, the answer turns out to be a very definite no. I'm going to prove that for you now. So I need to investigate d2y by dx squared. The second derivative, of course, is the first derivative of the first derivative. So let's write it that way, like this. And then remember y was f inverse of x. And we've got its derivative just disappearing off the top of the page here. It's 1 over f primed of y. So that's the item that we've got to differentiate with respect to x. We're going to need the chain rule again. After all, that y is really y of x. So the chain rule tells us we have to do the derivative of 1 over f primed of y, and that'll be a y derivative now, and then multiply that by dy dx. The first differentiation here could be done in one of two ways. You could think of it as a quotient and use the quotient rule, or you could think of that 1 over f primed as being the same as f primed to the power negative 1. In that case, you'd be using the chain rule. It doesn't matter how you do it, the final result is the following. And then, of course, we still have to multiply by the dy dx. But remember, dy dx, that's the derivative of f inverse, was just 1 over f primed. So that makes a cube on the bottom altogether. And then we could change to the d notation. So on the top, the second derivative of f with respect to y. But remember, f is the same as x. x was f of y. So that's the second derivative of x. It's d2x by dy squared. And on the bottom, it's the cube of dx dy. So this is the correct formula relating the two second derivatives. I'm sure you can see that they're not mutual reciprocals. In fact, they're both on the top. There's a minus sign and a cube of the first derivative underneath. It's much more complicated than one might have guessed. So please don't go replacing the reciprocal of a second derivative with the derivative the other way round. It's just not right. It only works for first derivatives. I'll stop.